It is my honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker. This is uh, Colonel Biggleman. He's a 1993 graduate of the United States Military Academy and was commissioned in field artillery. So I was really stoked when I got the opportunity to introduce Colonel Biggleman. And people don't understand that when you're from Boston and you put the word artillery in the first sentence, A's and R's don't go together. It's very difficult for us. So I had to practice. So I think I've got the rest of this down. His military education includes um, Office of Basic Advanced Courses, Combined Arms and Services Staff School, Master Fitness Training Course, Joint Firepower Control Course. I don't know what that means, but that sounds badass. I like that a lot. Um, Light Support Offices Course, Jump Master Course, Ranger School, Air Assault School, Mountain Warfare School, there's that word again, Warfare, and U.S. Command and General Staff College. Wow, right? My favorite part, though, of that he has a PhD in exercise physiology and a master of science in applied sports science. So that's really cool. Um, since 2019, he's served as the director of holistic health and fitness at the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command Center for Initial Military Training, Joint Base Langley. Could we have a round of applause, please, for Colonel Bigelman? Thanks, Trisha. That was a wicked good introduction. My brother's uh, wife is from Southie, so I, uh, I understand how you speak and I get it. So, hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Kevin Bigelman from the United States Army. And it's a real pr privilege to be here today to talk the Army's holistic health and fitness system and the Army combat fitness test. I um, want to thank Marcus, MD, and the entire Fusion Sport team for hosting this great session. It's great to get out of uh, rainy Virginia and come here to the beautiful weather of uh, Las Vegas. So thanks. Now I've got uh, three warnings before I start. Number one, we use a lot of acronyms in the Army. So H2F is holistic health and fitness, and then Army combat fitness test is the ACFT. I'll use a lot more as we uh, progress. If I say something that you don't know what that means, just let me know. Secondly, did anybody uh, go to the Auburn sum Summit last week? Okay, you guys are authorized to go to sleep right now because you've heard this uh, speech before. So uh, we'll wake you up for the tour. And uh, thirdly, I, you know, I, I know we've got this great tour planned after this. Um, and I know we've got a great social, so I'll keep it to 415 on the dot for sure. Okay, so here's the agenda I'll follow. Uh, I, first, I think it's important that uh, I always educate folks about where we come from in the, in the uh, U.S. Army, and that's the Training and Doctrine Command, or TRADOC. That's where Carl and Francesca are assigned to. Then I'll talk H2F, and then we'll talk ACFT, and then I'll move into uh, any questions that you might have. So here's the TRADOC mission. What do we do? We take individuals that want to be soldiers and serve our nation and train them and educate them. We take volunteers to come into the Army. We educate them, we train them, and then we send them out to operational units. And then continually through the lifespan of a soldier, we'll educate them over the, the time. It doesn't matter whether the soldier's in the Army for three years or 30 years, they'll have continuous touch points with the TRADOC uh, mission. Simply put, we train, educate, and uh, then field soldiers to the operational forces that will go out and fight and win our nation's wars. And then as the name implies, TRADOC, we also take care of the operational doctrine, and we'll touch on that in a minute. So right now, across the Army, as of today, there's 36,000 soldiers in some type of training all across the uh, U.S. We run 37 schools and centers at 27 different uh, installations or locations. We teach over 1,000 courses in 108 different languages. We train just under half a million soldiers every year, including 36,000 uh, service members from the other branches, 8,000 uh, foreign or international soldiers, and then 28,000 Department of the Army civilians. For new soldiers, we run basic combat training at three different locations, including Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And basic combat training lasts 10 weeks. We also have what's called one station unit training or OSIT. And we do that at Fort Benning, Georgia, where we train our infantry soldiers and our armor soldiers. And then also at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, where we train our engineers and our military police soldiers. And one station unit training lasts 22 weeks. 
And then finally, we also have what's called Advanced Individual Training, or AIT. That's at 21 different locations throughout the U.S. And we train soldiers on one of 156 different specialties, whether it's aviation or cyber or surgical tech or anything in between, you name it, we probably uh, train it. And then annually, we bring in about 120,000 soldiers every year to enlist into the Army and about 15,000 officers. So here's our organizational chart. You always got to show an org chart in the Army. We're a four-star level command. So you can see uh, subordinate to the four-star level commander, a numerous uh, two-star level commands. And I'm part of what's called the Center for Initial Military Training. It's that, that circle there. And I think this might be a build. Yeah. We're the uh, proponent for physical fitness in the Army. And uh, we're also the proponent for the Army's holistic health and fitness system. So we always talk about why we started this system. And, uh, you know, it's, it's real concerning to us that uh, of the youth that are aged 17 to 24, about 70% of those folks are unable to serve in the Army for a variety of reasons, unable to serve in the military for a variety of reasons. And that number is getting bigger and bigger every year. So the eligible pool of recruits is getting smaller and smaller. And so if you say it's 30% that's eligible to, to serve in the military, well, some of those 30% they want to go to college or they want to pursue a trade or technical school or go another route. And so it, it's challenging for us to find uh, quality individuals to serve in the military. And then once we get those soldiers into the Army, we've got issues. We're a reflection of society. So we've got issues with overweight and obesity, uh, just like uh, the rest of the U.S., the rest of the world as, as it's becoming. We've got uh, sleep quality and quantity issues. Uh, a recent study you may have seen showed that uh, over 50% of our drill sergeants sleep less than five hours a night. If you sleep less than five hours a night over five days, you're clinically sleep deprived. So that's not good. We also make poor nutritional choices. Our food courts on the installation don't make it easy to find uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, our dining facilities on post do have quality food, but the allure of um, Chick-fil-A and In-N-Out Burger is often too strong for soldiers and they go outside the gate to eat which is a problem. And then if you were to survey a unit, over half the soldiers in that unit uh, would sustain a musculoskeletal injury in that year. And that, those musculoskeletal injuries are costing the Army about $577 million annually, and that's not sustainable uh, by any stretch. So, so what is H2F? Really, H2F is about changing the culture of health and fitness in the Army for the better. It's about individual soldier personal readiness. Uh, we're trying to optimize uh, soldiers, both physical and non-physical domains, individually. We're trying to reduce training injuries by training smartly. Let's do a form of rehabilitation to prevent injuries from happening in the first place. But we know that soldiering is a contact sport. Soldiers are going to get hurt. Um, when they get hurt, let's surround them with the right folks and uh, get them back into the fight a lot quicker. The real backbone of H2F is what we call the H2F performance teams, essentially interdisciplinary teams of physical therapists or, or physios for the, the Aussies in the group. Uh, occupational therapists, registered dietitians, strength and conditioning coaches, athletic trainers, and cognitive performance specialists that surround the soldier just like a, a football team would. So I mentioned earlier that we're the proponent for doctrine in the Army. Um, the previous doctrine that we have was, was a field manual called Field FM 7-22. It was about this thick. Guess how many soldiers read it? Not, not many, not many. Um, but it came out in 2012, and the Army was engaged in uh, significant operations around the world, so I don't, uh, I don't disparage anyone for not reading it. But uh, recently, in 2020, we released this document to take the place of FM722. It's called Holistic Health and Fitness. It was written by a smart group of folks on our team over a three-year period. And while it talks about the physical domain, it also talks about the non-physical domain. So we have dedicated chapters on sleep and spiritual readiness and mental readiness and nutritional readiness. We've got exercise physiology in there a little bit. We've got uh, special conditioning for soldiers. So for example, we've got pregnancy and postpartum training guidance for the first time ever in the Army's history. And um, you know, I think it's, it's a, a huge step forward for us. Establish the doctrine and then let that doctrine educate the force. There's also two companion manuals to the document. Uh, and eight, they're called ATPs, Army Techniques Publications. One talks about the Army's Occupational Physical Assessment Test, or OPAT, 
the ACFT and the Combat Water Survival Test, or CWST. The second talks about HF drills and exercises. So I believe it's a revolutionary step forward for the Army. Okay, this this falls on, uh, you know, you folks know this already, but a lot, of, a lot of folks in the Army don't know this. Interdisciplinary teams supporting athletes has been around for a long time in, the pro, in pro sport and collegiate sport. Our USASOC folks and our SOCOM folks, uh, United States Army Special Operations Command and Special Operations Command, uh, they've been experimenting and, and using subject matter experts in their footprint for the last 10 years. And so um, about five years ago, the Army really started to pay close attention to how we take care of our soldiers. And quite frankly, we knew more about our tanks and our Apaches and our Bradleys than we did about our individual soldier, our most important weapon system. And that's not right. So we created the H2F system to uh, really focus on our, our most prized possession, which is the individual soldier. We went live on 1 October of 2020. Okay, yeah, these are the five domains of H2F. Uh, obviously, the physical domain is easy for soldiers to understand. It's about strength and power and coordination and agility and balance and anaerobic and aerobic conditioning. Um, nutritional readiness is a little bit more challenging. Uh, it's, it's the fuel and the hydration needed pre, during, and post-exercise. And, you know, you, you talk to most soldiers, or I, I watch most soldiers after uh, physical training, and how do they refuel? They grab the Monster, and then, or they grab a uh, bag of chips, and they're good to go for, till lunch, and, and that's not right either. So it's, it's an education piece. Uh, the third domain is sleep readiness. And I, I would put this as the most important domain. If you're not sleeping right, everything else in your life, from physical to your work performance to your family, uh, goes down the hill, and it goes down very, very quickly. Um, in the Army, we've got a, a pretty bad saying. We have a couple of sayings related to sleep. You'll often hear soldiers say, sleep is a crutch, or I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, that, that kind of stuff um, is, is nonsense, and it gets people hurt or killed. And so we're trying to change that mentality across the Army. Uh, why don't we refocus and get soldiers to actually care more about recharging themselves than they, they do about recharging their cell phones? So we're making small steps and trying to get in that direction. Mental readiness is a little bit more uh, challenging for soldiers to understand. Um, it includes things like uh, visualization for, a for as a form of mental preparation. And I often talk to soldiers about, uh, you know, I'll give an example like, hey, you think Tom Brady has, has thrown that touchdown pass 10,000 uh, 10, times in his mind before for a game? And they give me the nod. And then I say, hey, wh why don't you do the same thing with how you load that artillery system or how you clear a room? You should be, you should visualize success and make it as a form of uh, mental preparation. You know, the battlefield is a, is a, uh, it's a very chaotic and uh, deadly uh, scenario. And so soldiers are gonna be exposed to uh, horrific, uh, tragic uh, circumstances in combat. And so let's get them mentally prepared for what they're gonna see and hear and do. And let's, let's get them to uh, move through that experience and then come out on the other side better. And it's, it's all through mental preparation, something that can be trained for sure. And lastly, it's uh, the spiritual readiness domain. It's not about religion uh, per se, but it's about your values, your beliefs, being something bigger than, uh, than you are. It's, it's an intentional practice. And our chaplain likes to say, you know, you can't get uh, buff by sitting on a couch. You can't practice your spiritual readiness by not being intentional about it. So it's, it's an area of... Uh, focus that we're, we're, we're definitely uh, emphasizing the military in the Army specifically. So if you look at that uh, chart, you'll see that the brigade is kind of the centerpiece. A brigade, for those that don't know, is anywhere between 3,000 to 5,000 soldiers. And in the past, we've always had a medically-based system. So if a soldier got hurt, they'd get referred out to the medical treatment facility. The example I always use with my guys, my team is that you know, I hurt my shoulder a few weeks ago or a few months ago, and I went to see my primary care manager the next day, and she said, yep, you've got a hurt shoulder. You should go get PT. Here, call this number. So I called that number, and three and a half weeks later, I was able to get a, a PT appointment. Not, not great. You know, in the meantime, I'm not, I'm not getting any better. I'm probably getting worse. Uh, if a soldier's got an alcohol issue or needs to see a counselor, they get referred out to see the garrison uh, assets. If a soldier needs to bolster his or her resiliency, they get referred out to the uh, Ready and Resilient training centers. If a soldier needs to work on their fitness, they get referred out to our fitness centers. And, and I've heard some stories of soldiers actually paying money to a personal trainer to get to get fit. And that's that's not right. If a soldier's got army body comp 
standard issues and they want to get uh, better uh, in terms of fat mass to fat-free mass, then they go see their Army Wellness Center, again, outside the brigade. And I can attest that soldiers don't do things that are convenient or easy. They've got to be convenient or easy for them to do, do it. So um, th they're not going to get in their car and drive to see these assets. So here's, here's how we're uh, revitalizing uh, the system. It's more of a performance-based uh, readiness system. Uh, that's, that's what H2F is. It's interdisciplinary teams that are working together to support the uh, health and fitness of the individual soldier. It's surrounding the, the soldier with uh, these specialized subject matter experts, just like a football team would do. Uh, we know this system works for elite athletes in our country. Why not uh, work for athletes or soldiers that uh, are prepared to give their life for the country? And so um, those of you that have served know that brigades are the, um, they take real great pride in their individual unit and they're proud of being in a particular brigade like first brigade of the 82nd airborne division and so putting these enablers into these brigades will make soldiers feel like they're part of that uh, that team it's it's a proactive system it's all in-house and it's much quicker response time and that's that's why we do it so picture this if you will a soldier's on an airborne operation uh, on landing they come down and they uh, they blow out their acl so they wait till the knee gets back to normal then they go see the doc the doc gives them surgery and then as soon as they're out of the the uh, hospital as soon as the surgery is done the athletic trainer and the pt are, are right there and they work with that soldier to get range of motion back and then to get strength back and they might do things like blood flow restriction training and the nutritionist steps in and prescribes the right diet to get that soldier back in the fight quickly and the ot and this cognitive performance specialist get in there and get involved because that soldier is going to be on his his or her back for a couple of weeks away from the unit. Soldiers don't like to be away from the unit. So they'll, each of those members would give mental uh, strategies for that soldier to, uh, to stay positive, to get back into their unit, to back in the fight. Um, and then lastly, the strength and conditioning coach is there to uh, make sure that uh, the rest of the body is, is still exercised while the, while the limb is, is healing. So that's, that's kind of the philosophy. I, I know this audience gets it. Here's the uh, structure that, uh, the H2F performance teams look like. It's led by a, a GS-13, a pretty high-ranking Department of the Army civilian. Uh, we've got a couple sitting in the audience today. The green rectangles uh, represent military positions, so active duty Army captains or majors that are PTs or physios, OTs, and registered dietitians. The blue rectangles are the same disciplines, um, and each of those, both the military and the civilian, come with their assistants, their enablers, like a, a physical therapy assistant, nutritional care specialist, and occupational therapy assistant. And then uh, the gray boxes are capability that's already in a brigade right now. And then these, and then probably the, the bulk of the, the items that you see up there are the, the beige boxes. Those are strength and conditioning coaches, athletic trainers, and cognitive performance specialists. Um, and uh, those are all contracted positions. And these teams come with garrison medical equipment sets uh, for home station training. And then when these, when brigades deploy, the, obviously, the military folks will go with them and they'll bring deployable medical equipment sets. So I talked about kind of what we're doing at the strategic level, establishing the system for the Army. You guys probably don't care about that. What you care about is what's happening down on the ground, what's happening down at the tactical level. And, uh, you know, this is a quick look at uh, First Armored Division in Fort Bliss, Texas. Take a look at the top left uh, box. You see athletic trainers and strength and conditioning coaches working with soldiers, obviously doing the bench press. Uh, you may not think that's uh, exceptional or revolutionary, but I do, uh, because for the last 28 years since I've been in the Army, we've never had to do strength training exercises. We never trained for power. Um, so it's a, it's a fundamental cultural shift in the way the Army thinks about training. To the uh, top right, you see women that are either pregnant or postpartum, and they're actually conducting training. How do we do this prior to H2F? Any of the Army folks in the crowd want to tell me? We didn't. We looked at a pregnant soldier, a postpartum soldier, like they were, like they had a, an issue. Like, get out of here, go, go walk around the track, or go do something, and that's that's just wrong. Keep them in the formation where they can uh, be with their unit. Their unit can see them training. They can see their unit training, and uh, you know that that's how a pro sport team would handle it. That's how a collegiate team handles it. That's how the army's handling it now, which is great. Uh, the bottom uh, left-hand corner is a brigade commander, a colonel probably a very busy uh, individual. He's in charge of 3,000 to 5,000 soldiers. He's actually taking time out of his schedule to talk to new soldiers about the importance of sleep 
and nutrition and physical and mental and spiritual readiness. And then the bottom right, I think we've got some quotes up there from uh, Vince Lombardi and uh, Louis Simmons, but more importantly, we've got uh, registered dietitian advice on soldier, what soldiers should uh, eat and drink before and after exercise, something we've never had in the Army. Over the next several years, we're going to develop what's called Soldier Performance Readiness Centers, or SPARKS, yet another acronym. And SPARKS are really uh, dedicated training facilities. They'll be about 40,000 square feet where a soldier will train strength and power and coordination, agility, and balance, and aero anaerobic about uh, one to two times per week. This is where the subject matter experts will live and work out of. Um, as, as we've set this up, soldiers will enter zone one. Uh, in the blue there, they'll conduct a warm up. We call it preparation drill. Uh, then they'll move into zone one, where they'll conduct um, loading of the spine exercises like the squat and the deadlift, front and back de uh, squats and deadlifts. Uh, these are viability groups. Previously to this, the Army is trained as a one size fits all approach. And, you know, a, a 340 pound deadlift might be a stimulus for that gentleman right here in the front row, but I can't do that. So, so we should we should train individually, um, and you know in this in this zone we've got strength and conditioning coaches and athletic trainers circulating on the floor. Uh, we're working out in teams of about four soldiers each. We'll train there for about 15 to 20 minutes, then we'll move to zone two. Where we'll conduct uh, accessory muscle group training, which is uh, kettlebells and dumbbells. Same thing under the supervision of strength and conditioning coaches and athletic trainers, and then we'll close out with zone three high intensity training. We've got things like. Uh, pushes and pulls, sleds, um, Nordic skiers, concept two rowers as examples. And then once the exercise is complete, we've got athletic trainers to provide icing, taping, rolling, uh, just like you would treat an athlete. And that's what we're doing for the soldiers. There's dedicated rehab space uh, in this facility. There's also cognitive uh, space for training and there's classrooms for education. And uh, some of the soldiers in, in here, maybe some of the, the non-soldier -folk, non folks might ask, well, how are you going to get three to 5,000 people through these facilities in, in you know, one or two times per week? And we're going to change the, the paradigm in the Army of when we do PT. Uh, right now, our PT hour, or our physical training hours are normally 6.30 to 7.30 or 8. We've got to treat physical training now. As, it's so important that it happens throughout the day. So units are staggered through this facility throughout the day to make use of the subject matter expertise and the equipment that's that resides in this uh, facility. Okay, as I said earlier, I, I think I might have mentioned this, you know, this is about a culture change for the Army. It's about uh, getting soldiers to understand the requirement for fitness and health. And, the, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the deal to wear the uniform. Uh, but I believe if you want to change culture, you've got to educate. There are so many acronyms up here. Um, I'll just, we'll just leave it alone. But I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. All you need to know is that uh, whether you're a soldier, a non-commissioned officer, or an officer, throughout your lifespan, you'll get the right age, age, H2F education that uh, that marries with your um, career path. And so let's let's get the soldiers right when they come into basic combat training. Let's let's train them right. Let's help them understand the fundamentals, and let's grow on that uh, throughout the rest of their time in the Army. And I believe this is the best way to shape uh, change. Okay, uh, if you're a taxpayer, you're spending a, a whole heck of a lot of money on uh, H2F, and but I think it's an important uh, investment for sure, and as do the Army senior leaders from the Secretary of the Army to the Chief of Staff and uh, everyone that I've talked to. And so when this money was committed, uh, they asked us to really look hard at our return on investment. How are we measuring H2F? How do we know if it's successful? We developed a series of 16 metrics. Some are medical in nature, actually half are, are medical in nature. Uh, some are programmatic, some are administrative, some are quality of life, and uh, we'll compare the H2F resource brigades to what the rest of the Army looks like. And we'll do that pre -COVID, uh, using pre-COVID data for the rest of the Army. And since we're in Vegas, you know, I'd, I'd place a bet that uh, we're going to see an incredible amount of money saved across the Army by implementing the system. It's, it's just how, um, it, it's, it's how pro teams operate, it's how collegiate teams operate, it's how most high school teams operate because frankly it works. So that's uh, H2F in a nutshell. I'm still cognizant of time. Uh, I, always want, I always like to put in a pitch on H2F that uh, you know, we could get away with the system right now if we fixed what we're doing upstream. Like what, what happens during the first 
zero to 18 years of a kid's life. Do they get good quality physical education? No. There's about four out of the 50 states that actually have good compulsory physical education. The rest don't. Do they get good nutrition in, in schools? No. Do they understand the importance of sleep or mental readiness? No. And, and I'm, I see it firsthand because I watch, I've got uh, two daughters and a son, 12, 10, and 8, and it's, uh, it's atrocious what's going on in, in our, uh, our, our youth schooling system. So I believe we could save all this money in H2F by revamping how we train our kids. And, you know, the example that I've, I've, I've often said, and many of you in this room may have heard this, you know, um, you, you can't teach uh, uh, adults that are 18 or 19 or 20 years old that are coming into the Army how to run and jump and throw. It's, it's much, much harder. they got to learn those things uh, as a youth. And, you know, one of the examples I'd like to use is about, you know, throwing a baseball, something most kids used to do. Well, if you don't know how to throw a baseball, it's pretty hard to throw a grenade when you get to basic combat training when you're 18 years old. So I would say if, if I were king for the day, we would we would shift focus to how we educate our kids physically. I'll get off the uh, soapbox now and talk about the Army Combat Fitness Test or the ACFT. So why do we need the ACFT? Well, for the last 40 years, we've had the a test called the Army Physical Fitness Test. It's a uh, it was an okay test for the, the years. It, it uh, required zero equipment. You could administer it anywhere, Iraq, Afghanistan, home station, no equipment, um, but it it sucked. It, it, it only measured muscular endurance and uh, aerobic capacity. And those aren't the skills that you need to survive in combat. And then we also found too that uh, kind of, if you, if you look at the yellow and the red uh, boxes up here in this, this uh, Excel spreadsheet, we found that our older soldiers, not only the active component, but in the reserve and guard, were getting so hurt as they aged. And some of those those ages that where the yellow starts, you know, 35 years old, 40, 45 years old, they were getting so hurt or broken, as we use the term in the Army, that they couldn't take the standard three-event APFT. They couldn't do push-ups anymore because they had shoulder injuries. Uh, they couldn't run the two miles because they had knee injuries. And, and that's, uh, that's a serious problem. So we instituted the test. Uh, to really get after that fact. So let you take a look at the objectives of the ACFT. Uh, it's just a simple physical assessment of what we expect soldiers to do in combat. And we have, a, we have these tasks that are called uh, common soldier tasks and warrior tasks and battle drills. Those are the things that soldiers need to do to survive in combat. One of them, for example, one of the most physically demanding is extract a casualty. And being unfit in combat is not only a, a liability to yourself, but also to, to others that you serve with. Um, and so just like H2F, the ACFT is really about uh, individual soldier physical readiness, changing our culture. There's a mental toughness component to this test because it's challenging. Uh, there's also a pretty neat uh, competitive edge to this test. Soldiers love to compete against each other and uh, they, they go head to head in this competition where in our previous test, the Army Physical Fitness Test, we had to turn around and not even watch the performer in front of us now we've got head-to-head -head competition, so it's it's definitely a uh, a step forward. Lots of science going on here, uh, but just suffice it to say that the ACFT was based on what we call the baseline soldier physical physical readiness requirement study, the BISPER study. Yet another acronym. Uh, we started this test uh, testing about ten years ago. We identified the most physically demanding soldier common tasks and the warrior tasks and battle drills, and then we set up uh, a warrior task simulation test, essentially an obstacle course. We outfitted uh, soldiers in their, their battle gear, their kit. We ran them through the obstacle course. We looked at their performance, and then we tried to correlate their performance to validated exercises that, that already exist in the literature. And uh, we found that uh, and that's how we created the six events of the Army Combat Fitness Test. And we found that the, the correlation between, uh, or the prediction rate between the Army Combat Fitness Test and the Warrior Tasks and Battle Drills was about 80%. And that's pretty darn good for um, a physical assessment. The previous test, the APFT, was only about 40% 40, 40 predictive. So uh, we believe this is definitely the right way to go for the Army based on the uh, science. Here are the uh, test events. There are six events done in order. Uh, the scoring scale is from it's um, from 360 points as the minimum passing up to 600 points as the maximum. So there's 60 to 100 points for each of these events. The first event is the three rep max deadlift. 140 pounds is the minimum standard, pretty easy. 340 pounds if you want to max it at 100 points. Next is the standing power throw, measure of lower body power. Take a 10-pound medicine ball 
and you heave it as far as you can up and over your head without going over a line. 4.5 meters for the minimum standard, 12 meters for the max standard. The next we went to the hand release push up, essentially lowering yourself to the ground and then your arms come out and then they go back in and then you execute one push up just like this. Anybody know why we did that? Yeah, it's to standardize it because we found with the APFT, was this going down all the way or was this going down all the way? And soldiers, they're competitive. They like to uh, get as many points as they can. So this is a way that uh, standardize it, but it also lowers the number of push-ups that you can do. So it's less wear and tear on the shoulder uh, girdle. Uh, grading scale in this test is age and gender neutral. Doesn't matter whether you're a 51 year old male or a 17 or 18 year old female, combat is uh, age and gender neutral. And uh, if you ask women, they, uh, they prefer that uh, the scales are the same for men and women. If you ask men, they prefer that the scales are the same. So it's, I believe, a win-win. Uh, the next test is the sprint drag carry. My favorite event, you start in the prone position, go down 25 meters, sprint down, and then sprint back. And then you pick up a sled. You grab the sled with two hands, pull a 90-pound weight backwards, simulating a casualty evacuation, and then back. Then you do a lateral, down and back. And then you pick up two 40-pound kettlebells, and then you go down and back. And then you close out with a final sprint. It's a good anaerobic test. The fastest soldiers can do it in about a minute 30. The slowest soldiers can do it in about three minutes. Next is a leg tuck. All you do is suspend yourself on a bar and raise your knees to your shoulder or to your elbows. Shoulders, gosh, that'd be hard. Um, and, and the minimum standard for that is just one. Maximum standard is uh, two. If you're not ready for that event yet, we authorize soldiers to do a plank, uh, but you got to hold the plank for a long time to get, get all the points. So it's better to do leg tucks. And then we'll close out with a uh, two mile run. Minimum standards, uh, 21 minutes. Max standard is uh, 1330, so pretty easy. But uh, it's, a, it's a hard test to do really well on. In our previous culture, everyone, most soldiers got a stro strobe for a 300. Now it's hard to get a 600. For all the Canadians in the audience, we stole this uh, tiering system from the Canadian Army, Truth in Lending, recognizing that there are uh, obviously biological sex differences between males and females. And so performance, while it's graded on an age and gender neutral scale, uh, things like order merit lists and promotions, do require that we uh, analyze folks based on their gender. And so we created a, a, a tiering score. We'll run it every year. And if you're in the top 1%, you'll get, be categorized as, as platinum. And right now, top 1% of the Army is for males, it's probably 585, 585 points. For women, it's about uh, 525 points. And so those scores can be reported on your efficiency reports and your evaluations to recognize individual um, excellence. Here's the video. There's no sound to it, but uh, just take a look. See, see how you like it. It's only a, about a minute long, so hang in there. This is the this is the sprint drag carry. I do hear sound. So use a hex bar for the deadlift. Soldiers running with ammunition cans. Soldiers running with kettlebells. Evacuating casually off the battlefield. Similar to the, the sled drag. There's some pretty strong soldiers there. Ninety pounds on each uh, sled. Doesn't matter if you weigh a hundred pounds or you weigh two hundred twenty pounds. All right, let's drive on. So, hey, that's it for uh, the H2F and ACFT overview. I'm proud to work with this uh, team of 
Department of the Army civilians and soldiers and contractors. It's a small but uh, mighty group of folks. I believe we are changing the uh, culture of health and fitness for the Army. I hope that when my kids uh, grow up and they, if they want to serve the Army, then, then we've got a great system to take care of them uh, as they progress through their Army uh, experience. Uh, we are hiring PTs, OTs, RDs, strength and conditioning coaches, athletic trainers, cognitive performance specialists. So if you're interested, you can come see me afterwards. I'll swear you into the Army and uh, we'll, we'll send you off to basic combat training. But seriously, we are, are looking for them. Uh, <laughs> That's it. We're happy to share any any things that we've anything that we've experienced uh, and learned from over the last two years establishing the system with anybody. We're open source. We don't have any secrets. Please send me an email and uh, or talk to Francesca or Carl. And uh, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. We'll take any questions that you have now. Joe. Yes, sir. Um, a question about, so the POI, both on the enlisted side from OSIP basic training to Sergeant Major's Academy and, and officer at Folig or ROTC through War College. Um, in your opinion and your, you know, um, and in accordance with General McConville's sort of guidance for, you know, for this program, is there the thinking that this program is going to take that long to sort of change the culture or have those leaders to come in either at the on the enlisted side or the officer side and have those POIs be taught sequentially over their careers to then funnel back down to why is it important? Why are we doing this? How it's going to impact soldiers' careers? Um, I, I know it's an, an opinion question, but. Yeah, the, uh, the Army senior leadership is, is very uh, supportive of this program. Obviously, they invested a lot of money in it. Uh, General McConville, in particular, is an athlete himself. He's married to a dietitian. He's got kids in the Army. He definitely gets it. And so our boss has asked us to, understands that uh, education is the way to change culture. Our boss has asked us to get the, the POI change in basic combat training. So we've got one training developer. He's back at Fort Eustis as we speak, uh, working on, on what that POI looks like. We've also got POI inputted into um, our non-commissioned officer courses uh, to help them understand the cultural change. West Point similarly is, is uh, embraced holistic health and fitness and they're training their officers. We're working with Cadet Command. We haven't gotten very far yet with them, but um, certainly that's another avenue that we need to tap in. You've got to train soldiers, you've got to train leaders to understand the system to make it work. Once you get leader buy-in, culture begins to change. Thanks. Sir, Lieutenant Walker from Oklahoma Army National Guard. Um, in looking at the ATP 7-22.01 and .02, they're heavily focused on the physical readiness pillars. Do you see in the future any that expansion to yep. the other pillars being very clear on what is right and what isn't right? Yep, uh, that's a great question. Uh, we do, and uh, you know, it's like the I think I've heard that the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, once they finish painting it, they start over the next day and they start you know painting it again. We, we, we're doing the same thing with FM722. We've got a uh, individual back there, some of you may know him, Dr. Chip East, who has already started the revision process. And one of our objectives is to make the ATPs more holistic in nature, because you're right, they're focused heavily on, if not exclusively on the physical domain. Good afternoon, sir. Hey. Um, going back to the uh, theme of culture, in the uh, objectives, it was listed that um, the change in culture was part of the objectives. Uh, I was just want to ask is, how's that being quantified? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't think we've got a, a, a good answer for it. Um, but I believe that if you're going to change culture, you've got to get leaders to embrace the system. So, you know, the example I gave earlier about, you know, sleep is a crutch and sleep is for the week. For example, when you're training you've got to get leaders commanders to change the way they do business and they've got to put out to the soldiers hey the, the days of you know going 24 hours straight or 36 hours or 48 hours are over and in in my unit we're, we're not going to do that um it's it's leaders not commissioned officers and officers setting the example 
not walking into uh, the unit with a cigarette hanging out of their mouth or downing that uh, Red Bull, but actually uh, living in, in uh, healthful behaviors. So I think we don't, there's, there's not a good metric for it that we're tracking, but I believe that engaged leaders will be the, the key to change in the culture. Good question. question thank you um the quality physical education discussion has been discussion for a long time right um is there is the army fighting that on the back end um yeah. to change any of that and do you actually feel like it'll be changed uh, i do the, the good news is that uh people with stars on their shoulders in my organization um, many stars on their shoulders are actively engaged with congress um, there are uh, several folks that are out there representative ryan from Ohio, Representative Quaylar from Texas, Senator Ernst. You know, these are powerful uh, individuals that are, are really behind uh, the holistic health and fitness system and really believe that in order to optimize human performance, we've got to change the way that we're, we're educating our youth um, because it's, quite frankly, it's, it's a national security issue. We're running out of people to, to man the force. And if you heard General Milley, the chief of staff, uh, several days ago said something very, very similar. You know, we've got some pretty, pretty bad threats out there like China. Um, and so we, we need to change. Our, um, thanks, sir. Uh, I, I know you joked about the staffing at the end there, but is does HUF have a plan in place for staffing some of these positions? Because I know myself, I, I struggle to to, to hire a couple strength coaches and often have to poach from professional sport and Olympic committees yep. and I'm not hiring hundreds of strength coaches. So is there a plan in place to, to kind of, yeah, that's a good question. You know, we, the way I describe it, we turned up, open the faucet wide open, um, with really zero notice to academia or the folks in the athletic training business or the folks in the strength and conditioning business. And so we are now playing catch up. We've got, uh, most of the PT positions filled. Uh, there aren't many OTs in the Army, so we're having to grow those. Uh, we've got the dietitians uh, pretty well fielded, but the strength and conditioning coaches, uh, that's a challenge right now. And the athletic trainers, I believe, will also be a challenge. But I believe over time, uh, once, once, those, once we get folks into those positions, they'll realize what a neat group of uh, people soldiers are, and they'll want to stick around because the culture in the Army is, is fantastic, and uh, soldiers are, are great groups of uh, people. I might be biased, but uh, you know that's just my opinion. But it's a good question. Yep. Thank you, sir, uh, Sergeant York, the Arkansas Guard. I was curious as to you mentioned education being very important, and uh, in implementing H two F, is there a plan moving forward to? perhaps have a school for soldiers for H2F, much like the MFT programs or MRT programs, something like that, that can educate the soldiers on H2F and the culture moving forward? Yep. Good question, Sergeant. Uh, you're exactly right. We believe that the Army will move to establish an H2F academy. It's not going to happen this year or next year, but uh, in the near future, I would estimate between five and six years from now, uh, we'll establish an H2F academy. If you're a PT, OT, RD, strength conditioning coach, athletic trainer that's being assigned to an H2F resource brigade, you would go through that uh, academy, uh, get educated, and then you'd go out to the unit. We do also believe that uh, the Army will move to an H2F MOS, much like uh, the Brits PTI, their, their physical training instructor. This would be an NCO, it would be a reclass um, MOS, where the NCO would have strength and conditioning experience, but also understand the impact of sleep and nutrition and spiritual, mental, and performance. So uh, there's a lot of interest in that, and we've we put some uh, intellectual energy into establishing that. But again, I think that's several years years away. All right, we'll be around uh, tomorrow too, so if you've got questions, happy to field them. Thanks.